All right, I need to make a confession. I've lived in Germany for over seven years now, and I still struggle with something. Hey Siri, convert 500 grams of flour into cups, milliliters of milk into cups, 60 grams of butter. Hey Siri, hey Siri, hey Siri. I still don't instinctively think about units and measurements in the metric system. Hey Siri, convert 425 degrees Fahrenheit into Celsius. Mm. Close enough. Virtually every country on the planet uses the metric system for weights and measures and utilizes Celsius for temperatures, save for three, Burma, Liberia, and the United States, where we still use miles, pounds, yards, gallons, inches, and Fahrenheit. But besides the fact that making the switch to the metric system would make conversions much, much easier, the United States' unwillingness to switch over to the metric system has come with serious consequences. Our expectations for the success of the mission uh, are, are remote at this point. So why does the United States avoid the metric system? What is the true cost of non-conversion? and what attempts have been made to fix it. Well, let's take a look. Copy, Bravo 997, thanks. We have ignition and we have liftoff of NASA's Mars Climate Orbiter as we continue to explore the mysteries of the Red Planet. Back in 1999, an international and extraterrestrial disaster unfolded above the Martian skies. The Mars Climate Orbiter, a robotic space probe launched by NASA, was at the end of its nine and a half month journey to the Red Planet to study Martian atmosphere and surface changes. However, it fatefully approached 170 kilometers, or 105,633 miles, too close to the surface, and the Mars atmosphere destroyed the spacecraft, incinerating three and a half years of work and over $327 million of resources. An investigation was promptly launched with a board finding that the primary cause of failure all came down to a discrepancy in the units of measurement. A single piece of ground software supplied by Lockheed Martin produced results in a United States customary unit while a second system on board the spacecraft, supplied by NASA, expected those results to be in metric units, also known as SI, or the International System of Units. This meant that each time the spacecraft balanced the change in momentum with a thruster burn, the spacecraft moved further away, not closer to its supposed location. Fine. But to be honest with you, the chances of uh, hearing from them will be greatly decreased. No signal from the Mars polar lander uh, reaching Earth. And while this specific example of unit conversion is quite frankly out of this world, it highlights the real consequences of unit confusion. After all, not very many people instinctively know that one pound is equal to 0.4535923737 kilograms. It just rolls off the tongue, right? <laughs> so how did we get here? Officially, the U.S. uses a system known as U.S. Customary Measures. It is an adaptation of the imperial system brought over during the colonial times when we were still part of the British Empire. The U.K. is now officially metric-based, but some of the old imperial units of measurement are sticking around there, too, because old habits are hard to break. Common examples include miles for road distances, pints for beer and cider, and stones and pounds for body weight. And perhaps these measurements stick around because they're comfortable, familiar, and you can visually approximate it. A foot, although varying to great degrees, is more relatable than a meter, which is originally defined as one ten millionth the distance from the equator to the North Pole as measured from Paris, France. An inch is about the width of an adult thumb, which is where we get the phrase, as a rule of thumb. But the same familiarity is also true for the mile, which actually draws its roots back to ancient Rome, where it represented a thousand paces. 
This was, of course, revised over the years, thanks again to our British forefathers, who determined in 1592 that officially a mile should be eight furlongs, which was the length of a plowed trench that a team of oxen could pull in one day. But you can copy and paste this to other units of measurement too, whether it be for a pint of beer, a bushel of corn, an acre of land, or an engine's horsepower. But some measurements are just truly frustrating. Despite the fact that the word ounce comes from a Latin word meaning one twelfth, there are 16 ounces in a pound, thanks in part due to a system developed in the late Middle Ages and the international wool trade. That being said, Temperature measurement to me is a really interesting thing that us Americans have pushed back against. In comparison to Fahrenheit, Celsius is pretty reasonable. It's an easy unit of measurement to think about. Both the freezing temperature of water and boiling points are a nice round number, 0 and 100. In Fahrenheit, these are 32 and 212, which admittedly seems pretty illogical. But the history behind why the United States still uses Fahrenheit thankfully makes at least a little bit more sense. Back in colonial America, Fahrenheit was really useful. And to be fair, at that time, there really wasn't a consistent or standardized way to measure temperature. We should have two different unrelated scales of temperature. One of them will make sense to the entire world and the other will be super random. Our great nation will use the random one. But then a German scientist came up with the Fahrenheit scale when he invented the mercury thermometer in 1714. Yeah, that's right, Germany. You're partially complicit here too in this crime against humanity. Now, there are conflicting theories as to why we have this somewhat arbitrary system of heat measurement, but the most popular theory is this one. At the bottom, for the zero degree mark, he picked the temperature of a brine, a mixture of ice, water, and table salt, a common 18th century method of lowering the freezing temperature of liquids. He set 32 degrees as the temperature of ice melting in water. And for a reproductible high point on the scale, he chose the temperature of the blood of a healthy person. Fun fact, in this case, the healthy person was his wife, which he measured her temperature in her armpit and fixed it at 96 degrees, which no is not actually the correct average body temperature, but let's be honest, now isn't exactly the time to get nitpicky about accuracy of measurement. After Fahrenheit died, his successors used the boiling point of water to calibrate the thermometers, and they set it at 212 because it retains the size of Fahrenheit's degree. And with the publication of his new system of measurement in 1724, Gabriel officially became a member of the Royal Society, the oldest scientific society in the United Kingdom. And as the British Empire grew in the 18th and 19th centuries, so too did the use of Fahrenheit and other British imperial units for measurement. But while the Brits were busy colonizing, the metric system was gaining popularity during the French Revolution back here in Europe. But until then, France had been home to a dizzying array of weights and measures, with up to 250,000 units of measurement in use in France alone. And other nations and regions within those nations had their own ways of quantifying the world around them. This was a measurable nightmare for scientists who dreamed of an international standard based on some universal, unchanging constant. So in the late 18th century, Enlightenment-era Frenchmen saw a tantalizing opportunity in the political upheaval that gripped their nation. To this end, the French Academy of Sciences decided that the measurement underpinning society should get an upgrade as well. The new system was readily adopted by the newly formed French state, but the public took a little bit more time convincing. People were reluctant to give up the old ways of measuring since these were inextricably linked to local rituals, customs, and economies. To help, the government installed these standard meter bars all over Paris more than 200 years ago in an attempt to introduce a new universal system of measurement. If you want to geek out, you can still visit one of these last remaining meter bars on the ground floor of the window of the Ministry of Justice in Paris today. But eventually the use of the metric system became widespread, thanks in part due to rapid industrialization and the first of the great world's fairs, also in Paris 
where nations gathered to showcase and compare industrial and scientific knowledge, something admittedly pretty tricky to do if you didn't have clear, standardized measures such as the meter and the kilogram. Fast forward to the 20th century, and most countries around the globe had fully made the switch to metric. Even Britain, the very country from where our modern U.S. customary system owes its inspiration, decided to go mostly metric for economic reasons in 1975. In other English-speaking former British colonies like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand decided to officially make the switch to the system of measurement in the 1970s as well. And while we're on the subject of useful systems that actually help to improve your life, I want to give a shout out to Incogni for sponsoring today's video. If there's one thing that I think we can all universally agree on, besides the metric system, is that no one likes spam calls or emails. But have you ever wondered, how do they get my phone number in the first place? Marketers buy your personal information from data brokers and scrape your contact details from people's search sites like Google or Bing, as well as more complex data brokerages that contain detailed information about your financial records, medical history, and more. And of course, in addition to this sort of information, these databases also have access to your phone number, which can generate further calls. This isn't usually dangerous, but can result in constant everyday disruptions and increased stress. Now, the good news here is that we actually have the right to demand that our name and information be taken off of these lists. The bad news is that it's really hard and laborious to do this. But thanks to Incogni, I don't have to be worried about this happening again because they do the legwork for me and take me off of those lists. I signed up for this a while back when they came to sponsor a video and it has really made me feel so much safer and less bothered by unwanted spam calls. Plus, I can actually use their dashboard to see them working in real time as they continue to guard my privacy. So if you too want to take back your privacy, use code Ashton at the link below down in the description of this video to get a big discount, 60% off the annual plan of Incogni. So why hasn't the U.S. made the switch to metric two? Well, interestingly enough, we did. In America to learn the metric way. It's a simple system based on tens that you can start today. Since the 1975 Metric Conversion Act, official U.S. government policy has designated the metric system as the nation's preferred system of measurement for trade and commerce. However, if you read the fine print, it's voluntary, which means that while the government may nudge industries and individuals to use the metric system, in fact, they even set up a metric board to supervise the transition, it was pretty much set up to fail from the get-go. One example of this clunky transition was with road signs. Federal officials attempted to turn a new interstate in Arizona, I-19, into a metric poster child in the wake of the new law, even giving it kilometer markers instead of mileposts. A massive campaign ensued, filled with public service announcements and 16 millimeter film strips distributed to classrooms throughout the country, readying the nation's school children for the inevitable switch to the practically universally used metric system. Unfortunately, it's turned out to be more of a gimmick than measurable change. Transportation officials never extended metric-only signage to the remainder of the federal highway system. Although, yes, you can still drive along this 63-mile, uh, I mean, 102-kilometer stretch of road from the southern border to Tucson with metric signage today. But by and large, the American public had a major say in the metric transition, and quite frankly, a lot of people just didn't want to do it. Even though it is short-sighted, motorists didn't want to have to read signage in kilometers and kilometers per hour and then look at a dashboard with miles per hour. They didn't want to have to tune into a radio station to hear the weather reports and hear the temperature read to them in Celsius. And a lot of organized labor unions fought the change as well because a new system of weights and measures would mean their workers would have to retrain. And I promise I am not on a one-woman mission to hate on Ronald Reagan, but he did, in fact, dismantle the metric board in 1982, just seven years after it was formed, pretty much killing any chance that the U.S. 
would switch. Now, this is my own personal opinion, but I don't think that the U.S. will ever fully convert to metric, at least not in my lifetime. Yes, the metric system makes more sense, and yes, the metric system is easier to use for conversions, but the U.S. system is incredibly consistent, even if it is consistently giving us headaches. Almost every nation on Earth has fallen under the yoke of tyranny, the metric system, forced to measure their environment in millimeters and kilograms. In a lot of countries around the globe, but especially here in Europe, they adopted the metric system during a time where the country itself was unifying under many different institutions, standards of law, and governmental organization. Germany adopted it in the 1870s as part of the unification of the German Empire. Italy did it in the 1860s following the unification of the Italian Peninsula, the Netherlands in 1816 as part of the newly formed Kingdom of the Netherlands. You catch my drift. But while it might not ever become official, the U.S. is already kind of secretly metric. U.S. children are actually taught the metric system in school, typically starting in elementary school and continuing throughout high school, especially in science classes. Which is why some American industries and professions use metric as standard. From engineers to chemists, physicians to pharmacists, the metric system is standard for scientific measurement and research globally, ensuring consistency and facilitating collaboration across international scientific communities. So if you work in the sciences, chances are you're working in metric, even in the United States. A melting pot of different measurements that will make Europeans throw little tantrums. In short, a land of liberty. And despite the American proliclivity for dubbing our way of measuring as freedom units, in 1988, U.S. Congress passed a law which required federal agencies to use metric measurements, which is why the U.S. military has also adopted the metric system, especially in the areas related to international operations and logistics. And private industry is largely on board as well. In 1992, another bill required businesses to use metric for consumer goods too, which is why you find both units of measurement on most prepackaged goods sold in the United States. By the way, this actually has nothing to do with the product's ability to be sold in other markets. Here in Germany, those brands only list metric, which yes, is frustrating because almost all companies have to create two separate products and maintain dual inventories, one to be sold in the United States and the other in almost every other country. But nonetheless, I think all things considered, you know, unless there is real meaningful economic or social change that can sway public opinion, I think the U.S. is just too set in its ways to fully switch to metric at this point. We have internationally accepted standardized conversion scales, and I think for a lot of Americans, fixing this issue feels more like a pet project than a real national benefit. Even despite all of the great worthwhile reasons to do it. But I would love to hear your thoughts on it down below in the comment section, especially given all the international audience members who watch these videos. I think it would be so interesting to understand how the metric versus imperial unit conversion impacts your life. And for my American audience, what do you think? Is it time to switch? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from Type Ashton, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.